about uh, a, a leader in particular. This leader happened to be Deborah, who was a judge. Uh, we read about her in the Old Testament book of Judges. She uh, was very uh, uh, truthfully a God-appointed leader for a time to the Israelites. She was one of only two people that held both the title of prophet and judge. The Israelites actually sought after her because of the wisdom that she had been given by God in settling the Through her, God delivered the Israelites from 20 years of cruel oppression by the Canaanites, one of their many enemies. God used her to direct Barak, the leader of the Israelites' army, to conquer and overcome the Canaanites' army and to set them free from that bondage. Through her faithfulness, through her trust in God, the Israelites saw 40 years of peace. She was a, an incredible example of a leader to us, of her trust, her faithfulness, her hope. This morning we're going to take a look at another Old Testament leader that we can learn from this morning. This leader is a little bit different than what we might typically think about when we think of a leader. Because this individual is not credited with a whole bunch of wisdom in settling disputes, nor is this individual talked about in terms of courageous leadership in leading the Israelite army to any kind of victory. In this case, we're going to talk more about a leader who is an example of how to live. So we're going to see it in his life. Little bit is said about this particular leader, but what is said gives us plenty to think about, gives us plenty of insight to look at. The glimpse that we have of this particular leader is listed in the genealogical reference in Genesis. So if you want to flip open to Genesis this morning, we'll get to it here in just a little bit. Let me kind of set the stage for you again this morning. The earth and everything in the earth has been created. Adam and Eve have foolishly eaten from that tree that we all wish they never would have eaten from. They have been kicked of the Garden of Eden. They are no longer allowed to dwell there. Sin has entered into mankind. Cain has killed Abel. Murder has happened. And in a certain way, there, there's kind of a pause right here. Creation has happened. Sin has entered man. Cain has killed Abel. So Abel is no more and Cain has been kicked out. Cain is, is alienated. So, so now what? Now what happens with God's perfectly planned creation? What happens with a man and woman that that God created, and what's going to happen down the road? This is where our genealogy lesson kicks in, in Genesis chapter 5. What we are about to read here is another line or another branch of Adam and Eve. And this happens to be the line which eventually leads to Jesus. Okay? This is where we're going to get a glimpse of our leader this morning. And this leader is Noah's great-grandfather. See if you can pick it up as we read through the text this morning. We're going to read through all of chapter 5. Now bear with me, I know it's a lot of genealogy, but I want you to hear what is written in this chapter. This is a written account of Adam's family line. When God created mankind, he made them in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them. And when they were created, he called them man. When Adam lived 130 years, he had a son 
in his own likeness, in his own image. And he named him Seth. After Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Adam lived 930 years and then he died. Let me pause right there for just a second and throw out something to you. This seems incredible. Who could have ever imagined somebody living 900 years? I just want to point out very clearly that we accept the entire Word of God as truth. Just because I don't understand how this took place doesn't mean it didn't take place. The purity in which man was created certainly played a part in the length of their existence. And there's a point in time in Scripture that God says enough's enough and He numbers the day of man. But at this point, yes, I believe it was a legitimate 900 years. Let's go on. When Seth had lived 105 years, he became the father of Enosh. After he became the father of Enosh, Seth, Seth lived 807 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Seth lived 912 years and then he died. When Enosh lived 90 years, he became the father of Kenan. And when he became the father of Kenan, Enosh lived 815 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enosh lived a total of 905 years and then he died. When Kenan lived uh, 70 years, he became the father of Mahalel. And, when he, uh, and after he became the father of Mahalel, Kenan lived 840 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Kenan lived 910 years and then he died. When Mahalel lived uh, 65 years, he became the father of Jared. And after he became the father of Jared, Mahalel lived 830 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Mahalel lived a total of 895 years and then he died. When Jared had lived 162 years, he became the father of Enoch. And after he became the father of Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Jared lived 962 years, and then he died. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. And after he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and then he was no more because God took him away. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he became the father of Lamech. And after he became the father of Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Methuselah lived 969 years, and then he died when Lamech lived 182 years, he had a son. He named him Noah and said, He will comfort us in the labor and painful toil of our hands caused by the ground the Lord has cursed. After Noah was born, Lamech lived 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Lamech lived 777 years and then he died. After Noah was 500 years old, he became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. There's a total of 10 generations listed in this chapter of Scripture, starting with Noah, Adam and going to Noah, the great flood. And it's actually interesting to look at this because this one little chapter of Scripture kind of represents man's existence as a whole. You see creation in Adam and Eve. You see the, the representation of, of, of evil or separation. fresh so in an essence it kind of wraps up the whole uh, story of mankind in this one little chapter our leader today whose name means dedicated has a pretty unique calling in this particular text that we just read through the person we're going to look at is the seventh from Adam or Enoch Simple fact, 
uh, that he is the seventh from Adam. Uh, to this entire uh, scenario that we read through. Keep in mind that seven most often represents completeness or perfection. Now, we're not saying in any way that Enoch was perfect. The scripture tells us that all have sinned, except for Jesus himself. So he was still a sinful man, just like all the rest of us. But that seventh from Adam, there was something special about him, something special about his relationship with God. And we're going to come to see that by what is actually said about him. Took place after his 365 years. You know, one other just very simple reason that he is re- referenced as the seventh from Adam is that. Uh, Cain also had a son and named him Enoch. Two very different individuals. So a simple clarity uh, is, is referenced here in calling him the seventh from Adam. Let's talk about something that is not specifically noted in the text we just read this morning, but it is made clear elsewhere in Scripture. Enoch not only obviously had a good relationship with God, but he was used by God. How was he used by God? He was used to speak words of truth, words of warning, words of prophecy by God. Let's unpack this a little bit. From 1947 to 1956, 12 caves of Qumran were searched and over 900 texts were found. And I'm not Today we know these texts as the Dead Sea Scrolls. In that discovery, at least part of every book of the Hebrew Bible, along with that is an almost complete copy of the book of Isaiah. Very little of it is actually missing. In addition to all of those biblical scrolls that were found at that time, there were all kinds of non-biblical writings found at the same time in those same caves, mixed in with some of that biblical text. One of those writings that was discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls was the Book of Enoch. Didn't know he had his own book, did you? (laughs) Let me stress to you very carefully this morning, this writing, this book of Enoch is not considered to be canonical in any way, shape, or form. All right? In other words, this is not biblical text. We do not accept this as infallible, spirit-inspired scripture. This is not part of our Uh, of, of the Bible that we know, okay? It is not inspired Scripture. In fact, Enoch didn't even write the book. The date of the book is unknown, but based on the information, based on the writing, the book appears to be written by several different people over a long period of time and has been pulled together as a collection of writing and credited to Enoch. Why they credited to Enoch, I'm not sure, other than his name carried some weight. All right? Not all of the information contained in that book lines up with biblical truth. That's why we don't accept it as inspired, infallible text. It doesn't line up with the rest of the Word completely. Some of the text that is within this book are indeed quoted words of prophecy, handed down, assumably verbally, over the years. So there is some quoted prophetic word in the book of Enoch. But the rest of it actually appears to be false teaching, really. There's no other way to say it. 
even though the writing itself is not inspired, there is a tation from this book in Scripture. It's found in the New Testament. This is not unique to the book of Enoch. There are other non-biblical texts that are quoted throughout Scripture. And it seems that the first century church was very familiar with these particular So while the book was not written by Enoch, it does appear, it does bear his name. It is quoted in the New Testament. So I think we need to at least take a look at that this morning. Jude, the book of Jude, is where we will find the quote. Jude is the one who uses this discussion that Enoch has, or this, this quote that Enoch has, and Jude uses it when he's talking about the doom of godless men. Jude, verse 14 and 15. Enoch, the seventh from... words that that are indeed credited to Enoch and also appear in the book of Enoch. It based on these words alone when we talking about Enoch, it's easy to see that Enoch understood about God's coming wrath. A wrath that was inevitable because of the ungodliness of man. He clearly had received wisdom from God. And he spoke the words that God had called him to speak. Others have have, have written all kinds of stuff and put it in that book and claimed that it would come from Enoch, and that that is not the case. Again, I want to make sure we're very clear on that this morning. But mixed into that book, there is some truth, truth that was acknowledged by the first century church, Jude in this case. It's why Jude had no problem quoting from that book. And it's not the only book that Jude quotes from. He actually quotes from the Testament of Moses as well. Another non-canical book that he quotes from in his writing. Let's talk a a, a bit about um, some words that are spoken in our text from Genesis this morning about At a glance, it might seem like a a simple genealogy list, but the words that are recorded here are very specific, and they can tell us a great deal. Genesis 5.22 After he became the father of Methuselah, something seems to have transpired at this point in Enoch's life really doesn't talk a whole lot about what happened before Methuselah was born. But when he was born, it tells us that he walked, that Enoch walked with God. There's a change or appears to be a shift in Enoch, in his life, in what's going on here. We don't have any detail of what that is. It's not shared with us in text. But look at all the other descriptions including Adam. It says that they had their son and then that they lived for a period of time. But with Enoch, and only with Enoch, after his son was born, it specifically says he walked with God. That phrase indicates an incredibly close relationship with God. See, Enoch didn't just merely exist. He didn't just merely live his life. There was a unique bond between Enoch and God that we didn't see in any of those other men. You know, we could maybe talk about Adam when he was in the garden, but even after he was kicked out of the garden, we don't read that about Adam. Enoch walked with God. 
We get excited when we talk about King David and, and we think about how King David was a man after God's own heart. That's an incredible statement, an absolutely incredible statement. But why is that any more important to us than Enoch who walked with God? The Word tells us a few more things about David, so perhaps that's why Enoch tends to take a back seat most of the time. Um, so important is that for us to understand this idea that Enoch walked with God. It's repeated again in verse 24. Enoch walked with God. Then he was no more. Enoch not only walked with God, but he was one of only two people in all creation that did not taste death. He was no more because God took him away. Again, that whole genealogy we read through, everybody else that's listed there says that they had a child, they lived so many years, and then he died. That's how the description of them ends. But it's not the case for Enoch. He lived, he walked with God, and God took him away away from this world, away from his life, only because God or Enoch was so close to God would that even be possible. He was so in tune with God, God simply took him out of the world. Let's think about this for a little bit this morning. Perhaps God spared Enoch from everything that was about to happen to mankind. Think about it for a minute. From the time that Enoch was taken by God to the time of the flood of Noah's day, it's about 600 years, 670 years, somewhere in that time frame. Scripture very clearly tells us that the flood came because of the depravity of mankind. Genesis 6, 5, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Is this the ungodliness, perhaps, that Enoch was talking about in the text that Jude quoted, that prophetic word? A simple question arises here. Did God choose to remove Enoch from the world to spare him from all the wickedness that was about to take place and the eventual destruction of the earth through the flood? A destruction that God brought because of the wickedness of mankind, and he brought it on all living creatures. Genesis 6, 17, I am going to bring flood waters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth, took Enoch away when he did. Seems strange? It shouldn't. Shouldn't seem odd to us at all. The idea of removing Enoch prior to the destruction should not in any way be strange or confusing to any of us. Because this whole picture of God removing one who walked with him prior to the destruction of man is the very same thing that each of us as believers in Jesus Christ hope for all the time. We call it a rapture. Same concept, same idea. Taking of God's chosen before all that wickedness and destruction occurs. God will call every believer to his side. Uh, we're not going to unpack all of that this morning, but we, again, I said earlier, we believe wholeheartedly in the truth of Scripture. And Scripture very clearly talks about the end of days when the church will be raptured or taken away from this earth. That's the same kind of concept we see here 
with Enoch. A, a representative, perhaps, of what the church is. He was taken by God. It's a, it's a separation. It's a calling away from the destruction that is about to take place. So while there was only a few verses to speak about Enoch's unique relationship with God, perhaps part of that reasoning is a foreshadowing for us of what is to come. Think about it this morning for a minute. If a genealogy of our lives was listed and read out today, would it say we were born, we lived, and we died? Or would it say something more along the lines of we were born, we were born again, and we walked with God? few short verses written about Enoch. But they give us a tremendous insight to his leadership through example. To his influence over the people around him. And most importantly, to his relationship with God. From those couple of little verses we get a very vivid picture of the reward that waits each person that is dedicated to and walks with God. Amen?